So we started dealing with two weeks ago this question. What does Ecclesiastes teach concerning the destiny of man during this earthly life? And so we discussed Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. So we're down to Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Um, and so let's get, let's start with um, Naomi at the front. Uh, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. So what does Ecclesiastes teach concerning the destiny of man in this verse? What, what are we learning from this verse? We're beyond this like Bill. Yeah, yeah. What what are we learning about the destiny of man beyond this earthly life? Yeah. We'll be brought into judgment for all things. We're going to be brought into judgment, even from the things of our youth. Uh, sometimes we we think, well, youth is the time to experiment, is the time to learn what not to do, uh, and. Certainly during youth, we learn what not to do. We, we, have, we make some mistakes, hopefully mistakes we learn from. But that doesn't mean we go out seeking to make mistakes. We will make mistakes. Some mistakes aren't sinful, like as far as they're, they're just things we learn as we grow up. Some things, would, we, would, like lying and, and taking from others, and, and that is, is, is wrong. Like as far as it's sinful, and we, we learn from those things, but we should be taught about those things from our parents as well. And it is good to note here, though, that we will be judged even from the things that we do in our youth. It's not just what happens when we become adults. Uh, I think it's, I don't know whether it's the Amish or, or the Mennonites, one of those two groups for a certain age, they allow, their, uh, they allow their children to go out into the world and to <coughs> experience the world. Because remember, they're, they, uh, I think it's the Amish, because they, they don't really go out into the world that much. Uh, they have their own communities. And in certain communities, they allow their children to go out and experience the world at their youth. And then they want them to come back when they, when they turn 18 and become adults, having learned what the sins of the world were so that they don't follow in those. You lose a lot of youth when you do that. Uh, as we've discussed before, sin is pleasurable and hard to give up. And it requires humility and repentance to do that. You don't go and test yourself with how much sin or how much temptation can I withstand without sinning. They, they believe that, uh, the, the Mennonites do believe that, they, that it's okay for their children to do that. It's not okay uh, to go out and intentionally do wrong. We will be brought into judgment even from the things of our youth. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 4, and I think we're to bill for that. Ecclesiastes 12 <coughs> verse 4. 14. Four, 14, mine says 4, it's 14. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14. I'm really having a good morning so far. Um, for God will bring every eye to judgment, everything which is, is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So, we've discussed bringing into judgment. What's different about this verse than Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9? Something mentioned that wasn't mentioned in the last verse. Yes, Bill? Well, Something I wanted to give a touch on too in verse nine is, is about enjoying. Okay, yeah, we'll get okay. But but here it, it seems things that were hidden. Yes. Is in, so that's Okay, yeah. Uh, well and you can sort of get your, your point, whether it's good or bad from the, even this verse. Uh, so we'll deal with two things. Um, secret things. There are a lot of pe there are a lot of things about us that people do not know. We're good at hiding things that uh, are less favorable, let, traits that 
are maybe we're we're not happy that we have, but have not quite been able to control them. Uh, but we are good at controlling them when others are around. In other words, we put on a good face. Uh, we're good actors. There are people who seem to be Christians, but they don't live like a Christian except when other Christians are around. They behave differently. And that shouldn't be us. We should be behaving the same. But going back to Bill's other point, sometimes, and, and I'm going to be preaching a sermon, I think, at the end of next month, Lord willing, life is not about all about suffering. It's not, sometimes we can, we can think, oh, well, there's just so many things God expects of me, so many laws, I've got to be so careful, and if I, well, we do need to pay attention to what God's law says. But at the same time, Remember what um, the scriptures say, God's laws are not grievous. We, we can enjoy this life and be a Christian. There's just, sin is enjoyable, but that does not mean the opposite is true, that everything that is enjoyable is sin. And sometimes some people come along and say, well, if, if I enjoy it, it's sin. Some people do, do that with food. Well, uh, if you don't know, it used to be that the Catholics wouldn't put spices on food, make food taste extra special, because they believed that would lead to gluttony and indulgence. And after all, what is food for? Food is for nourishment of the body. And so we should not go beyond, above and beyond that to make it uh, just solely for enjoyment. Well, it can be both. They do the same thing with sex, too. Uh, and that's the reason for their doctrines on birth control, is that sex is for reproduction, and any enjoyment, that's, we got to beware of that uh, between, uh, between married people. And of course, we're talking about married people when it comes to sex, uh, not unmarried people. But life can be enjoyable without being sinful. Uh, I've always said that I look out at some of these parties and they drink and they do drugs and they say they're having a good time. The aftermath of that, of that though, it doesn't look like a good time to me. I can have a good time without drinking and, and doing drugs. People have seen me. People Sometimes people think I'm very serious, but uh, serious when you have to be, but I like to have a good time. I like to... Uh, play games, I like to go out uh, and uh, be around other people. Going, we're going to a sporting event this week. I, we, go, we go to shows all the time. Well, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And I like to have a good time, but that doesn't mean we go out and have to sin. We can enjoy this life. It's not just doom and gloom. In heaven, it's not going to be doom and gloom in heaven. It's going to be joyful. And so, while we need to guard against sin, let's not think of this life purely as a chore and that God's out to get us at every turn and he's there just wanting to cast us to hell, but if we, are, if we, if we persevere, he will accept us. That's not what the scriptures are saying. Do you have something, Jeff? Yeah. I come down to the difference between the love of earthly things or the love of God. Mm -hmm. If I love God, I'm thankful for the earthly things when I have them. Yeah, but there may come points in time in my life where things aren't enjoyable, things are difficult. Um, like Paul said, I've learned whether I have much or I have little, be content. Mm -hmm. so he had to learn both how to have much or have little. Yeah. Um, but if you love the earthly things and when they're not enjoyable, then you're discouraged and I'm happy. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. But if you love God, then whether you have them or not. Yeah, and, and I might go. I might go. Uh, and add to that, when you love God, you'll be looking for the things that God has provided for you. You'll be looking to the things of God. And you will not be tempted as much with the thing, to, be, to, to be taken off in the sin of the world. And we can find much joy in God. We can find, uh, remember, Paul, how many times did he say rejoice? Jesus says rejoice. Jesus said, be of good cheer. Like, we are to rejoice in salvation, 
but we are to rejoice in the things that God has provided for us. That may not be that much, but what he has provided for us, let's be thankful for that. Cal. What about, uh, it says God will bring everything but the good or evil into judgment. What about repentant sin? Like if he's going to judge the good things, yeah. he's going to judge the evil things. But what about people who have repented when they do wrong? Well, uh, the scriptures do teach that he's going to that he's going to uh, forgive those who repent and, and turn to him. But the verse is talking about it, the verse is warning us that both, if it's the good things, like as far as if we're if we are um, a repentant person, he's going to judge. The, we're going to be righteous before God. So he's going to judge those things. And if we haven't been repent, if we aren't repentant, well, what are the, the, the evil things that we have done are not forgiven. So uh, if we're righteous, the evil things have been forgiven, and we're not going to be judged on those things as far as, because God has already forgiven them. We will be judged on the righteousness that God has imputed to us. And whereas the evil person has those evil things that are not repented of. They are still, we might say, on their record. They have not been pardoned by God for those things. And so this is a warning to man that well, everything that we do comes into judgment. And we need to be forgiven of the things that are evil before God. Jack? David wrote in uh, Psalm 32, verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Yeah. So David understood back then that those things would be taken away. Yeah. Uh, so this is a warning this is a warning to the righteous and to the wicked. Uh, and it's actually warning about the secret things. Like the secret things are, are things that we think nobody knows about and God does. God knows about the secret things of the heart, secret things that we do in private, uh, when nobody's around. Whether they're good or bad, they'll be brought into judgment, and if they're bad, we better have repented of them and have God <coughs> forgive them. We confess our sins, Jesus faith or sorry, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to forgive us of all unrighteousness. First John one verse nine. When God forgives, he remembers it no more. Uh, and we should be thankful for that. That's what God's grace does. Uh, God's not going to come along and say, well, I forgave you of that, but no, he did forgive us of that. We might still feel the guilt of that sin or a shame for that sin. Paul never <coughs> forgot what he did to the church, that he persecuted the church. But Paul believed he was forgiven. I know who am I, I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day comes along and says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them who love his appearing. Paul had faith that God would forgive, and when, Paul, and when God forgives, he forgets. That is a, also a pattern for our forgiveness. If we truly forgive someone, we, need, we better not hold it against them, and lord it over them. Do you remember when that time when you did this? Then have we really forgiven? No. Does that sort of answer your question? Okay, good. So that's this question. So that's part of the content of Ecclesiastes. So we've covered the historical, we've covered the doctrinal, which leaves us with the last purpose of Ecclesiastes that we'll discuss, and that is Jesus Christ. As we've been looking out through the Old Testament, we've been looking for the Messiah for... Um, clues about what who the Messiah would be or how he would behave. And sometimes I said some of these books are a little bit of a stretch uh, when it comes to finding Jesus Christ because in the Psalms that we can find verses that are quoted in the New Testament, this is that. All right, that's obviously the Messiah. We can, we can find uh, prophecy in some of the Old Testament books concerning Christ, whether it's in the minor prophets, the major prophets, the history books that we've already discussed. And this one, uh, Ecclesiastes, 
does point man towards the attitude that Christ would want for us and maybe the attitude that Christ displays. So there is no messianic verses concerning Christ, but there are some attitudes that Christ would want us to have and that Christ displayed that come from this book. And so our first question is, how does the one shepherd mentioned in Ecclesiastes foreshadow Christ? So we come along and say, that's not a verse, that's not a verse that talks about Christ as far as a prophecy, but it is a verse that might foreshadow the one who would be the Christ, which is Jesus. And so let's read Ecclesiastes 12. We're in Ecclesiastes 12, and let Gord, can you get verse 11? The words of the wise are as goads, uh, and as nails well fastened are the words of the master of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. Okay, what is a goad? Oh, to, pardon me? No, but Christ said that all his heart kicked against the goads. Yeah. So it's something they can possibly kick. Okay, that's good. Prod. It's prod. And in, in this specific context, it when I looked this up, is to provoke or annoy someone so as to stimulate some action or reaction. He was goaded, sorry, he goaded her on to more daring revelations as an example. To drive or urge an animal on with a goad, and it's a prod. Like as far as you're, you're gonna prod them. Uh, and it's sharp. You wanna prod an animal, you don't, you don't get a dull thing. No, you get a big sharp thing. And when, Paul, uh, when Jesus told Paul, as Gord was saying, it's hard to kick against the goads, Sometimes the versions say the pricks. Well, we know what, uh, like as far as something that pricks, sharp. And so the words of the wise are as goads. They provoke us to do something. Uh, but we're dealing with one shepherd, which is the stuff, which is the thing at the end. And really, this is uh, this entire section emphasizes the failures of man's attempt to find satisfaction and fulfillment of life through worldly pursuits. Ecclesiastes points towards Christ who would offer abundant life, who would satisfy our spiritual hunger and thirst, and who would offer eternal life rather than earthly gain. Those are all the things Jesus Christ did. Getting back to this question though, how does the one shepherd foreshadow Christ? Who does wisdom originate from? Christ. Christ is the one whom the wisdom of Ecclesiastes originates. One shepherd. This, yes, we, we come along and say, Solomon wrote this. But remember, he, this is an inspired book, inspired by God. The words that we, we come along and talk about Christ, we call them words of wisdom. Those are words of God. He, did, he was the one who originated the wisdom that is true wisdom. Solomon wasn't the originator of this wisdom. Remember, he was given wisdom by God. And so when it comes along and talks about this one shepherd, Jesus is the one shepherd. He describes himself as the shepherd. He is the only shepherd that can lead us to eternal life. There are many shepherds that can lead us many places. But he is the only shepherd that can lead us to eternal life. Anything else? Well, that, that is the purpose. Now we get to the content. And the first thing that we'll discuss is, well, we've, we've really already discussed some of this, but it is the emptiness of life without God. And so one of the, this book demonstrates that even even with some of our greatest achievements in life, they are worthless if God is not the center of our thoughts and lives. Going back to what Bill says, it's not meaning that our achievements are empty, but they are empty if God is not the center of our life. Because why, why is that true? Everything is 
You always want it, but why is it vain, empty, which would be what vanity is? If God is not the focus of our life, why are the things that we do in this life empty? There's a couple reasons. Bill? One's for purpose. Yeah. <coughs> being told they're not a created being. Um, they're being told to live as they choose. They have no purpose. Yeah. So with no purpose. Yeah, you you lose your purpose in life. Remember, that's how Ecclesiastes ends. This is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. The whole book ends that way. And we lose our purpose. And because we lose our purpose there's, I have no idea why this world who, uh, what, that really doesn't believe in God believes in right and wrong. Because where does morality come from? It comes from God. If there is no God, then all of our right and wrong are just subjective. It's because I feel it's right and wrong. Gord may not feel it's wrong for, me to, for him to steal from me if there's no God. And I'm not saying Gord does, but I'm using that as an example. If Gord didn't believe in God, I may think stealing is wrong, but Gord may think, well, I'm just borrowing it for a little time. You have it, and I don't. I don't see why that's wrong. And if there's no God, I might have to agree with Gord, because it just may be my feelings that uh, on certain issues. But I lose my purpose, and I lose a lot of things, and my life is empty. Have you ever considered, when people get depressed, what happens? They think, Nothing they do is worth anything, that everyone, everyone dislikes them, that, that nothing, nothing good can happen from anything that I do. Are we considering God? Now, there are times when we get sad and extremely sad, and those are the times to turn to God because he can lift us up. It's truly empty if we have nothing to look forward to. I listened to a couple of the scientists, and they said, well, really... There's nothing to look forward to, and you'll die. Depends. Maybe you'll die soon. Maybe you'll die later. And really, you'll go into nothingness, and, and that's it. And I'm, wow, that is a depressing statement. That is absolutely depressing that there is nothing to look forward to. Why not just end it now? Because there are some people who are living pretty miserable lives, uh, not always of their own doing. I, 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 I don't understand that in one sense. We lose our purpose. Another thing is we leave it behind. We look at some people have left behind things that we still remember to this day, whether it's buildings, artwork, uh, writings. But if I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting to be a big famous person, when I die, I'm truly expecting the things that I have done to be forgotten. Not because they, they might have been bad things, but over time, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those preachers that is, is just famous and has written a lot of books and, and that people just know of. No. I'm not expecting to be remembered. And there are many people who are just not remembered. Not because they lived terrible lives, but because they weren't famous. They didn't get into the news. And people just didn't know them. They were what we call normal people, uh -huh, regular people. And we leave the things behind. We don't take anything with us. So in that sense, the things that we do in our life is vanity. But, the th but if we have God at the center of our lives, we will take something much more valuable with us than all of these earthly treasures. We will take our faith. We will take the forgiveness that we had. We will take God's grace with us beyond this life. And a poor person can be satisfied with God. A rich person can be satisfied with God too. We can be satisfied. We can be, as Jeff said, content. And so the question is, why is the word vanity used throughout Ecclesiastes with reference to the pursuits and achievements of life 
with, when God is not man's focus. We've already read Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2 many times. It's vanity of vanities. And that, that, the word vanity, I think, is used four or five times in that verse. And why is that word vanity used? James. It's useless without God. The word vanity appears 30 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. 12 chapters, 30 times. So if you did that, three and a half times a chapter if it was used in every chapter. No, it's not, but three and a half times every chapter. No, um, sorry, two and a half times every chapter. I can't do math. Uh, James. Jesus answers best, you know. What, it, what, it, what good it is to gain a whole world and lose his soul. Yeah. What, what, what does it profit you? It, it doesn't profit you anything. And so vanity is employed 30 times to emphasize the worthlessness of an approach to life's pursuits that lacks God as its focus. In other words, life apart from God has no meaning since God alone gives that meaning. No real meaning because it will all be left behind. All that's left is confusion and despair. Again, we've already discussed that. If, if I don't have God as, uh, in any part of my life, I can be happy with some of the things in this life, and then if I lose it, I won't be happy anymore. It's nothing to turn to. Whereas if a Christian is given earthly blessings by God and loses them, who can they turn to? Well, they can turn to God. They can turn to their brothers and sisters in Christ. They can find happiness even in being poor. They can do all of those things because they realize that there is something better ahead for them. Whereas, if we lose all of our earthly possessions and don't have God, what better is there out there for us? And even if we have all of those earthly treasures and keep them, sometimes we can still be uh, depressed in some sense because we realize that I can go to work, I can work all of these days, and I can work so hard and get all of this wealth and really, what is its purpose? How much, how much more things do I need? Um, and so, vanity is a word that, that Ecclesiastes uses a lot of times because remember, Solomon, this is a book written later in Solomon's life. Solomon was a very rich man. He was a very wise man. And he said, in the end, because I didn't focus on God the way I should, it was all vain. Let's not get to the end of our life and look back and say, what a waste. What a waste our life was. There are things, yes, we look back and we'd like to correct. Everyone has that. But let's use our life to do the good things that God would want us to do to help spread his message to the world so that others might not have vain lives, useless lives. Anything else? on uh, vanity. <coughs> We've discussed that usually a little bit further on. Sorry, James, did you say something? Oh, I thought you did. Um, so emptiness of life without God. Uh, the next piece of content is failure of worldly pleasures to provide satisfaction. This is what Solomon found out. Much of the book is relating to Solomon's experience of him search, of his vain search for real meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment through worldly pleasures. He did that. He, was, he wasn't looking to God, or at least if he was, he wasn't doing so fully. He was only partly doing that. But instead of looking to God fully, he said, well, I will build buildings, or I will uh, have pleasure in, these, in worldly pursuits. I will do all of these things. And did Solomon find satisfaction? No, he didn't. And that's a sad thing, and Solomon realized that. And so Dave's question is, what earthly pursuits failed to bring Solomon lasting satisfaction? And so we'll go to that. We will do some reading on that. Uh, we won't focus deeply on each of them because we, we can deal with them on a whole. But I'm going to start by Kala. Why don't you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. 
uh, verses 16 through 18. I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And I set up my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I realize this also is striving after, after the wind. Because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. So, we think of Solomon as a wise man. He sought after wisdom. And we, we, in the beginning we said, well, that's a good thing. He, that's usually when we focus on Solomon, we focus on that story in 1 Kings. And we say, well, how wise was Solomon to ask God for wisdom? And it was. He was a young king. It was a good thing that he had wisdom. But when then he trusted in that wisdom apart from God, that's what made it vain. Because... All the great wisdom, if you have not God, is useless. So, great wisdom, as Solomon tried to uh, find pleasure in. Lisa, do you want to get Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 and 2? So we have mirth, which is pleasure, and laughter. So pleasurable things in this earth, that's what Solomon tried to uh, pursue instead of God, and that didn't leave lasting satisfaction either because, as we know, with the good times come the bad times, and it doesn't last forever. We know that. Solomon knew that. He said that was vanity. Verse 3, James, do you want to get Ecclesiastes 2, verse 3? I search with my heart, how to cheer my body with mine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold of my body, till I might see what was good for the children of mine, to do on the heaven during the few days of their life. Solomon here sought after wine. People do that too. They, they, well, they would seek satisfaction in alcohol. And no satisfaction is found there. Solomon didn't find it there. Uh, we're back to... Sent. Rain, do you want to read or not? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Solomon's great projects. We think of him as building the temple, but he built palaces, he built gardens, he built orchards, and all of these things. And we do that sometimes too. Some people build, some people plant gardens, and they have great gardens, and they are very pleased with what they've done, and that's good. I'm not saying any of those things are bad, but if if we're looking for that to bring us happiness apart from God. That's not going to end bringing us happiness. He did, we're not going to find long-term satisfaction in that, and Solomon didn't either. Verses 7 and 8, Sandra, of Ecclesiastes 2. Two things here. He went for music. <coughs> music is good, but we can't find complete satisfaction in that. Great wealth. He tried to satisfy his earthly desires in great wealth. And women. We, one of the things that we know Solomon about is how many wives he had, how many concubines he had. And it's always the joke, I don't know how he did it. But he was trying to find satisfaction in those things. And so that may put it a context as to why he had so many wives. Because he wasn't following after God. He was seeking to be happy, and he just couldn't get there. 
Verse 9, I think we're to Shidon. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 9. So I became great, and I searched more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my victim remained with me. Again, he, he had great prestige. He was known as a great king. Other, pe other kings paid tribute to him. His kingdom was the largest that Israel's ever was. Solomon sought out worldly prestige. Couldn't find satisfaction there. And then verse 10. Henry, do you want to get verse 10? Whatever my eyes died, So again, this verse is talking about other worldly pleasures available to the rich. There are many things that rich people can do that we just can't afford to do because we don't have the money to do it. Uh, and so all of these other things, none of them were able to provide satisfaction. Verse 11, then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor that I had labored to do and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit and there was no profit under the sun. He had abandoned God, therefore all of these things, none of them bad in and of themselves, couldn't bring satisfaction because God was not there. And so those are all those earthly pursuits which will bring us to where we will end this morning and take up with, Lord willing, in two weeks, the answer to man's greatest question.